At one of the local meetings, Sonder caught wind of a guy who supposedly had some really beautiful gardens not too far from the homestead. So we decided to check it out, and we gave them a call, and they invited us onto the property. But when we got there, we soon realized it was going to be way more than we had anticipated, and we'll show you why. Uh, this is my brick collection. These are all red building bricks here. And then these are fire bricks on this wall, this wall, and the back side of this wall for furnaces and kilns and that kind of thing. And then on the other side are all paving bricks from streets and they go on around the corner. And the ones on the fence are sidewalk pavers, essentially street paver, but thinner. And I'm assuming you painted some of the... I highlight all the letters, so some yeah. of them they're hard to read if you don't. When and why did you start collecting bricks? I worked for a mobile home company and we had to move a 14 wide or 12 wide off a lot in our park, cleaning up the lot. And there were some bricks underneath it. I never paid any attention that they were marked, but we had a salesman by the name of Joe Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, and I noticed some of the bricks that we were picking up said Hayes run on them. And I said, geez, maybe get a couple of those for Joe and maybe you can put them on his porch or whatever. And then I found some Salinas, so I, I saved a couple of them. And, started paying more attention then and found some other ones. And, and yeah, this might be a stupid and, question, but I haven't really seen many marked bricks in my life. So you how do see the more the more you look. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of them, especially in rural areas that aren't marked. And it's the marking is basically an advertising thing. And the unmarked ones were made in small towns and so on that didn't have to advertise their bricks. They were used locally because bricks were very hard to ship early on because of the weight. It's not uncommon for letters to be printed backwards because it was easy to flip-flop a letter in the mm. bottom of the mold. Oh, yeah, the I see that. The S is backwards in the Kishqua. <laughs> I tell people the H is backwards, too, but they can't tell the difference. <laughs> and the uh, A. <laughs> this, this one's right. Uh, this is a Kishqua brick, too. So this, are these are these um, <laughs> worth more? Because there's uh, No, a, it's just no? an oddity. It's just weird. Uh, it happens quite often. Yeah. I don't know if the guy that set the letters in the mold still had a job or not, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, is every one of their bricks advertised? Like, have uh, an advertisement? Yep. Okay. And some of them have, like these, the lugs are different. Mm -hmm. This has square lugs that has, and the print's different on some of them. Mm -hmm. This is actually a Kushkaw sidewalk brick, mm -hmm. and it's got the K and the Q incorporated in the design. That's neat. <laughs> I mean, some of these are really beautiful. These, this one's funny, Well, of these course. were printed with a, a, uh, a non-skid surface, that's why they're done that way. And years ago, they put a couple of those don't spit on the sidewalk bricks on each block in chewing tobacco days. Hmm. Now with the COVID, maybe they'll do it again. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Bringing back some of those vintage bricks. Yep. Now, do people print on bricks anymore or is this? Oh yeah, Okay. Yeah. but there's very few brickyards anymore. Yeah. <laughs> there used to be literally hundreds and hundreds of brickyards. Uh, the uh, Hudson River Valley was had literally hundreds of brickyards by itself because all the bricks that the buildings in New York City were built of were easily barged down the river and they had a good clay supply upstream to the bricks with. So much history in one brick. I love that so, you have everything in uh, alphabetized here. I have the red bricks alphabetized and then the fire bricks alphabetized and the paving bricks alphabetized just so I can find one if I'm looking for a specific one. Uh, the only drawback is when I get a new one, I have to rearrange every shelf. <laughs> I was going to ask <laughs> but that. But I try to do that only once or twice a year when I get enough ahead of time. You, yeah, you almost need to have something modular, you oh, know what I mean? Uh, I'm imagining you started off with one wall and then you just like mm -hmm. <laughs> built this. I keep adding things. I, like, I added, added the, the trumpet. I added the archway there, yeah. <laughs> put bricks over the top. <laughs> this, this brick was found in the Catatunk Creek down between Candor and Owego by one of my friends who uh, actually became friends when his daughter got married here. But uh, this was laying that side up in the creek and gravel and water had washed the back side of it off and he just thought it was a very square rock and he picked it up. It's a Freeman brick. That was made in the 1860s in Virginia. 
So how it came to be from Virginia up to here is another whole story that we'll never know yeah. probably. But that's kind of a neat. Where are some of the last brick making areas around here? Uh, the last local one in New York State was uh, Horseheads. And I have, they made seven or eight different varieties at least. And are they still uh, in operation? Or? No, they went out in 56, I believe. Uh, but that was one of the larger brick companies around. There's actually an apartment complex called the Brickyard Com uh, Apartments in Horseheads now. Now, I don't know who made this one. This H was made by Horace, somebody that had last name of H in Cortland. Uh, you'll notice the bar is off-centered. These are all horse edge bricks and the bar is all in the center there. Mm -hmm. They made an H and HH and HH with four bars on it and HH with eight bars on it, HHDS with periods, HHDS without periods and bars. There's actually one that's only, to my knowledge, two been found that actually say horse heads printed out on them. Uh, these are horse heads bricks. The numbers don't seem to correspond with any years or anything. We believe they're batch numbers. Hmm. They probably put one number on each pallet that they did or whatever. After sharing his brick collection, Wayne took us to see some of his gardens. I uh, read a couple books of garden verses back in I guess it was 2004, 2003, 2004 during the winter. And uh, I, so when I got done, I made up my own garden verse and hand chiseled it into the back of that rock over here. A garden should be a delight for the eyes, a solace for the soul, and fuel for the imagination. Exercise for the body is merely a fortunate byproduct. There's 12 hour, hours worth of chiseling into that with a half inch coal chisel. This was my, what I refer to as my mother's memorial garden. And uh, when I was going to Cornell, and uh, so I lived here alone with my mother for 10 years and she died of cancer at the age of 54 and I made this for the last year of uh, her life. Did she like Black-Eyed Susan? Yeah, and Plox, and there's yeah. Iris were one of her favorite, and actually down the steps there's 48 different varieties of Iris. Wow, <laughs> but we're not in season for Iris, <clears throat> no, the blooming. No. But with the perennials, I've got something out year round. This year the gardens don't look as good. Uh, these aren't too bad, but yeah. the ones down back are so dry, a lot of the two thirds of my blossoms just blasted. It was <laughs> very dry this season. And all our rainstorms seemed to go, part of it went north and part of it went south. Yeah. <laughs> So this is one of my earlier sculptures that I did. I just do them for my own enjoyment. So that's Ferris the pruner beak spade back parrot found only in the wilds of Michigan Hollow. <laughs> <laughs> I love your sense of humor here. I think that's like an important thing too with your garden. You have oh, yeah. uh, an element of, uh, of humor just to get people to smile, I think. You, you have to. Yeah. If you go through life without it, you're gonna live a sad life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is my deer-proof garden. I deer. actually had deer hair stuck to the Shasta Daisy four springs ago where they scratched themselves on it during the winter. Oh, okay, but well, they, it's not that deer-proof then. But they didn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the rarest fossil ever found in central New York. Probably one of the 10 rarest fossils ever found in New York, period. This is a colony of glass sponges and there's only been 26 to 30 individuals of these ever found. Wow. They're only found within a 50 mile radius of Ithaca, this variety. There are other types of varieties of glass sponges, and this was a sea sponge in the ocean 360 million years ago. It's made of a silica type material. There are probably 10 or 12 different varieties of glass sponges from back then that had occurred over a wider area, so they're more readily found. But this mesh, when they're alive, they're flexible and don't break up. But when they die, it come very brittle and they break apart and don't fossilize. These were all buried alive. They go all the way through that rock. Was this uh, found in the quarry or? 
Nearby? Down, right down back next to that ash tree. Wow. They moved the creek in 1939, the town of Danby did. And uh, this was in the berm that I had plowed out the small piece, which probably broke out of that piece originally, yeah. and a hump that was in the lawn down back. And, well, that half weighs about 800 pounds, and this half about 1,100. So when we got up about a 45 degree angle, he could kind of lean back and look into it. And, uh, and we managed to get it flipped on over, and I could see what he was seeing. And he just sat down on the creek bank, and he says, you have no idea what we just found. He says, this is one of the 10 most important fossil finds ever in New York State, probably the most one, important one ever in central New York, and definitely the most important one ever in Tompkins County. He says, I've been to museums all over the world, and I've never seen a fossil this rare preserved in this quantity and quality any place. By the time he said all that, the hair on the back of my neck was starting to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> it almost looks like no. the, the base of a colander, you know what I mean? Which yep. is with the geometry no. of it. Uh, I asked Paul, I says, how did these things grow when I found the first piece? I said, did they add rings like a tree or what? He says, we don't know. There have been many of them found. Based on what we found here, we can't tell a number of rings. Even in this one, there's still a couple of rings that are buried in the sand there. But you see this little one, mm -hmm. how small the bands are and how yeah. close together. This guy here, he would have been approaching 20 inches, 24 inches in diameter, and you can see how wide the bands are. So apparently the bands just grow. The interesting thing is every one of them here that's visible has 32 radii which makes sense because the cells divide to go from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32. So we're assuming the number of rings are all the same, but we don't know exactly what that number might be. Hmm. Next up on Wayne's tour was his interior garden beds. Now, when I built the fossil house, the garden on the side hill went to the long straight stone wall along the top of the hill, and the lawn went up to it. And we wanted a fossil house where people could see it readily. So I designed these two gardens to tie in to the entrance, and I ended up with a bell-shaped entrance in the grass, kind of by accident. Oh, yeah. But it tunneled my vision from the house and made the garden look 100 miles away. So I added this structure, which is the clapper and the bell, if you look at it from above, hmm. and that brought everything visually closer to the house. It's a now, nice Paul little succulent donated garden. His garden variety fossils, and uh, some of these are museum quality pieces, but he terms as as garden variety. Mm -hmm. And he can tell you the genus and species of every one of these here. I know some of them, but I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the lucky stones, as they're called, with the holes in them. I've found a couple in Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, but you've, very shaped, kind of thin. Yeah. I got it, and I was like, oh, I can make a necklace out of this. Well, people say the Indians made them for necklaces and weights on their, their sinkers on their net. But they were made 360 million years ago. It was a fossilized crinoid stem in the rock, and there's a piece of one there. Oh. And when the glaciers came through, it broke off pieces of bedrock, and they washed around in the Finger Lakes and the Great Lakes. And uh, the fossil material was a softer material than the bedrock, so it eroded out, leaving the hole, and the bedrock remained. Now, on some of these, that one in particular, but you can actually see the ribs inside that. Hmm from the crinoid stem. This is actually a side view of a crinoid stem. They usually exude themselves as little donut-like structures. You'll see them over there. Some are laid down sideways, but some look like a little donut. Yeah. And they're like vertebrae stacked on top of each other. They're actually an animal that grew up from the bottom of the sea, a earmarked fossil, a Devonian period. They grew up with stems like limbs on them, and on the end of each branch there was a soft tissue calyx, kind of analogous to a fish gill. And I love how this is a, like kind of like a faux chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you see my cow in this window. Yeah. And, you know, if you notice there's a cat chasing a mouse in the other window. Uh, I love the look of it. I love even the, the roof overhangs. Yeah, I built it to look like a barn to kind of blend yeah. in with the It's like a Hollywood structures. set. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, this is my sundial here. But uh, there's roughly 56 tons of stone in this structure. Took a year and a quarter to build. And I know every rock personally. <laughs> uh, I hand sifted when I made the side, 
a bank garden here, I hand sifted every bit of soil there to a depth of 8 to 12 inches down to subsoil. All the rocks that came out of there went in the center of this for fill. The wall is six feet thick at the bottom on this, tapers up to about four feet thick. And then on up with a 26 inch railing. And over the fill stone in the middle, I put a layer of number two stones and a layer of number one stones and a layer of grits that the top stones are laid in. Uh, some of the top stones are eight, six, eight inches deep. Some are an inch thick. The sundial, the gnomon came out of a creek down in Lockwood which is the piece that casts the shadow. Each long rock represents an hour. So this is six in the morning, or the Roman numeral six, and white marble chips. That's the only expense I had in this was a bag of white marble That's chips. That's so $4. smart. Like, look at, do you see the six? But that's six, and then seven, eight, nine, the Roman numeral nine, 10, 11, 12. Now this is set for standard time, so this time of year you have to add an hour for daylight savings time. Right. Uh, I've had two weddings and one renewal of vows on the sundial. They were the only ones that were on time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but <I'm sick>. <laughs> <laughs> this is Louis the Lobster I made last year. Oh, he's cute. Look yes. at his little wrenches. <laughs> yep, those are called alligator wrenches, an old style wrench. This Fossils almost looks like a, the shell of a turtle. Yeah, and that's made from mud that dried like in the bottom of a mud puddle. Yeah. And then it was filled with a mineral that fossilized. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And then look at this one. Yeah, that was a piece of limestone that Paul found up to Moravia. It was hanging out of the creek bank in the spring after a rain. And the limestone had had a water washed a hole through it and the root had grown through the hole. Unbelievable. And it was dangling off the creek bank, yeah. so he cut it off. That, that was about four years ago. I'm amazed that that hasn't gotten broken out of there since. Oh, so beautiful. And you have some, but, this is a koi pond. Well, goldfish. Goldfish? Yep. I uh, was thinking about putting koi in, but I get blue herons that uh, stop by and fish periodically, and yeah. koi are expensive bird food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the goldfish will spawn up to three times a year. And I started out with eight, and there's probably 60 of them in there now. I've had over 100 in there. Are, there, are they cold hardy? In the, in the winter months? Yeah, it's 42 inches deep out here, so they just go down and hibernate. Wow. But uh, there's 14, 14 different varieties of water lilies in there. Do you ever have to remove some because they get too They're plentiful? all planted in pots. Okay. And you have to repot them every couple of years. Yeah. All the plants are in pots. The cattails have actually outgrown their pots, but that doesn't matter. But again, you'll see fossils of every description around here. Uh, when I built this, the water comes, you know, there's a 620 gallon concrete septic tank essentially underneath my spring house. That pumps a two inch line up around and out five ports out the wash limestone up here. When I built it, I was afraid that this waterfall being 18 inches high would overpower the sound of that. But up there, you can't hear this one because mm -hmm. it's in a stone canyon. Down mm -hmm. here, you can't hear that one, so it balances out. I love how you even planted some of the sedums here and yep. in with the fossils. A, a prickly pear cactus yeah. does fine here. Uh, it's great because it becomes like a rockery and stone the, like uh, stone the bridge garden. are pieces of uh, curbstone that the college threw out. I had three pieces with the same curve because they were set on edge in the street around the curve. And I had three pieces, but they were all three of them were just too too big a scale for the size of the creek, so I just used two of them. Who has the pleasure of mowing the lawn? I do. Oh, I enjoy it. How long does it take? I can mow the entire six and a half acres in about four and a half hours if it's not tall. I got a six foot uh, zero turn radius ferris. But I enjoy mowing lawn. I'm thinking about making a new flower bed. I get to look at it from different perspectives while I'm mowing, and I'll a lot of times mow the shape that I'm thinking of. And you know, after a couple weeks, if I don't like the looks of it, I'll change it, and I and I make it so that I can mow around it without backing up, because with this much lawn, you have to do it mm. efficiently. <laughs> so. And if I decide I don't want it there, I just mow it off altogether. <laughs> Further down into his garden, Wayne told us the story behind the creation of his watermill. 
So I worked for Jim Ray Mobile Homes, as I said, for 37 years. And uh, my boss bought the Albright Feed Mill in Newfield, which was ultimately part of the Newfield Depot train station. We went in to clean the building out, and the old mill feed milling equipment was in there. So I had the mill site and the milling equipment. I had to build a mill. <laughs> so I cut my own timbers off the side hill, helped saw them out in a the sawmill, the Kenneth's sawmill down in North Spencer. Sawed out everything up to 20 foot. He had a 20 foot carriage on his mill, so he couldn't get anything longer than that in the mill. And I needed six 30 footers, so I hand hewed those with a chainsaw and a single bedded axe. I hand mortised and hand tenoned every joint. I made my own wooden pegs, and we actually had a mill raising when we put that up. There are no nails in that structure until the rafters on the roof. That is absolutely and I amazing. Tore, tore down two old barns, one in Newfield and one in Enfield, that were falling down for the barn lumber to, to skin it with. I laid up all the loose laid stone foundation. Never saw a picture of the mill that was there until after I built this. Then I got a picture taken from the end of the field looking up across. And I've tried to blow it up, but it gets so grainy you can't. But it was about the same size building, but it had a straight roof instead of the gambrel roof that I've got. I love the gambrel roofs. I think they're so and, attractive. Uh, and the so. fact that you made it without nails mm -hmm. up into you know, the last part. It's just something I wanted to experience, you know. And it was a small building compared to what they used to do back then. And even I, just, I mean, look at the fence posts, how you did it in like an yeah, old fashioned I, kind of way. Yep, yeah, I made yeah. all those. Uh, they're set in PVC pipes that are set in the wall. So if one rots out, I can just pull it out and set another one in. What wood do you make the, these fences? These are locust. Locust, black yep. locust. Yep. I made my pegs for the barn out of black, black locusts. I read several books and they used anything from heart pine to oak to chestnut, whatever was available in their area. And locust is readily available here and it's as durable as anything, so that's what I used. So there's an area in Trumansburg known as Podunk. Yes, I'm familiar there's, with it. There's actually a Podunk Road. Yes. Do you know where the name comes from? Well, when I think of Podunk, I think of like, you know, kind of backcountry. <laughs> well, that's partially right. It comes from the sound of water running through a wooden water wheel, which you'll hear when I turn the pump on and start this up. It goes padunk, padunk, padunk. I never knew that. The advent of the steel wheel, which was more efficient than the wood wheel, but it didn't make that noise because it was a different material and had curved buckets. But it was more efficient, so the bigger mills that could afford to put a steel wheel in, put the little wooden water wheel mills out of business. So if you came from a has-been milling town, you came from a little podunk town. Now, almost every state in the Union has at least one, sometimes two or three villages still called podunk to this day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll start this up and you can hear the uh, podunk, podunk, podunk noise. this freewheeling, I just leave this on idle because if I turn it up to a higher speed, number one, it makes more noise. Number two, it runs the wheel too fast with it not hooked to anything. It just doesn't look good. I got to build a new water box that's been in there for 20 years and it's developing a few leaks, but it doesn't really hurt its operation at this point. Oh, that is now so You'll start cool. to hear that padunk, padunk, padunk noise. Now, I just had this going this morning, but when you first you can see it a little bit, it's a little out of balance. Yeah. When you stop a wooden wheel, the water drains out of the top portion of the wheel into the bottom, and it becomes out of balance. So in a wooden wheel mill, you had to keep the wheel running 24 hours a day, seven days a week to keep it equally balanced. Mine being 10 foot wheel, it doesn't affect its operation, but it wasn't uncommon to have a 30 or 40 foot diameter wheel. And if you did that, uh, Stop that at night. The next morning, when they started the mill up, it would physically shake the mill apart. So the miller had to stay in the building or building close to the mill and get up every couple hours. You could disconnect the equipment. They had to keep the water wheel running, so he had to get up every couple hours and oil originally wooden bearings and later on davit bearings to keep the wheel going and equally soaked. So I actually have a uh, miller's quarters upstairs 
a little more elaborate than he would probably enjoy, but gives me a place to display other stuff. Any idea what this is? This looks like one of those things that you do put the fence posts in. No. No? This is an icebreaker to break ice on the ponds and the oh. water troughs so animals can get drink in the winter. For ice fishing. Can you and do that? And this, I got it a, in a box lot of tools in an auction. I couldn't figure out what the heck it was, but I finally found out this is a, a barbed wire handler. Coils of barbed wire were very difficult to handle. So you put this in and you can handle your barbed wire very easily. <laughs> so you bought it without knowing what it was. Yep. And I, I love to find stuff like that. And again, that was in a box lot of stuff that I yeah. got. My, and then research it and figure it out. Wayne has been undergoing chemotherapy for cancer. And I had to ask what that meant for him and his property. What do you envision your property to be you know, after your, your past? I, uh, it's a big conundrum right now. Yeah. I would like the stuff to stay together. I've got a daughter and a son who would both love to live in the house. But I don't want to saddle somebody, there's a lot of work to take care of this, I enjoy doing it, and I don't want to saddle somebody with that responsibility for the rest of their life to yeah. maintain my collection if it's not really what they want to do. Yeah. My son has some interest in it. Uh, my daughter's middle boy, uh, he, he can name every tool down here and what it was used for. He loves antiques. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's not a cheap operation. Uh, I don't know if my son or daughter could actually afford to pay the taxes on the place at this point in time. Mm. So, I don't know. Is it something that, like, the historical society or something? Was... I would. I had considered giving it to the Spencer and Danby historical societies jointly, but they don't have any manpower or money to take care of it. Yeah. Even the big museums don't have any money at this time to take yeah. care of stuff. My grandfather had a Hercules gas engine, which was a stationary engine mounted on a cart that you took around from one piece of equipment to another. I never saw it. He'd sold it years before I came along. But when I cleaned out his shop, I found the instruction repair book for the Hercules gas engine. This has got a picture of the engine. It's got every nut and bolt, instructions, how they cost, and repair instructions, how it worked, everything in it. This reminds me I'm, of a little book that I got from my grandfather that is um, over 100 years old and it's a lumber book, you yeah, know, yeah. It's bound I, the same way. It I've looks got, uh, about that size. Actually, I've got a lumber book here. Oh, no, feed my equipment. That's it. That's, That's it, it. Right That's there. it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. That yep. looks ex That's it. I think this is exactly it. Yep. The Scribner's Lumber uh, and Log Book. I'm told if I took this to one of the steam engine shows that I'd probably get three or $400 for it. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, my grandfather's is from like 18 something or other. Yep. This one's 1882, so this one's a little older. His yep. is in really good shape. Um, but it, it's so funny because it had like a, a note in there where it's like, one of the best-selling books of like mm -hmm. <laughs> the decade or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. But I have a donation book here that uh, hopefully I've got everybody that's donated stuff over the years. I've probably missed somebody, but this is all stuff that's been donated to the mills and buildings. So you run this as a nonprofit? Oh yeah, I don't okay. make any, it's just my backyard. Yeah. Not a business at all. It's my playground.